Okay, um, let's get started. We've got one student who's connecting to audio. Well, maybe I'm not sure what's going on there. Okay, um, looks like the student's not connected. Can you hear me? So the first thing we need to worry about is how can you ask questions um, during the lecture? So let's see. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, now let's try, um, since there's only one student, just makes it easy because you can just interrupt it anytime you want and ask me a question. Okay. And let's see a couple of things. Um, first of all, you probably realize that things have changed drastically in the last week. Um, so we're still working out bugs. And so I'm sure as we go, go forward, it's going to be, um, we'll make adjustments and corrections. Um, so hopefully you can be patient, and if you got suggestions, please let me know. Um, and I'll do what I can. Um, the second thing is, and I need to do some tests. Um, I've got a class before this, and when I um, do it through Zoom, so records, as soon as I end the session, it then wants to save the, um, the session so I can post it online. And it took longer than I thought. I'm not sure if I can do both at the same, I can start a new session and at the same time record um, the other one. Um, so I'll do an experiment, that's what, so I wanted to wait until my first lecture was already, um, process before I start this one. I'll know better next time I want to um, test before I do anything. And let's see what else. Ah, yes. The third thing is um, talking to a computer is slightly different from talking to people. And here we go. And I need to um, learn how to talk to the machines in a natural way. So I'll work on that. Um, so I might end this class a little early to save my voice. Now, before we begin, are there any questions? We're now up to four people. No one has any questions. I'm good, thank you. Okay. Um, how about we try a few experiments? Can other people talk so I can make sure you, you can interact? Rodney? Yeah, Professor, we can hear you. Okay. 
Sanjita, can you say, say anything? Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, we're actually getting more people than normal. Has anyone figured out how to raise their hand in Zoom yet? Looking for the option. Do you have um, the ability to say answer yes or no? What I have here is you know, a window for participants, and I then have a yes or a no. Um, and when someone clicks on the yes or no, I can then see it on the list of participants. Are you seeing something like that? Okay, we got one yes so far. Anyone else have found the yes no button? All right. No, I can't find it. Oh, no. Does a thumbs up count as a yes? Um, try it and we'll see. So Sanchita has a yes. Rodney. Can anyone hear me? Yeah. So um, it's it's in the chat area, and you have to expand. Um, let's see if I can explain a little better. I must admit that my interface seems to be different probably because I'm the host. Um, I'm going to have to try and experiment tomorrow where I start a session and then try and log in with someone else and see what happens. As we go forward, you want to look at um, uh, it's a yes or no, and also thumbs up or thumbs down. And also, there's a chat session. Um, which I have open, and we'll see if that is effective. As far as trying to lecture, any questions, issues? I think. Can, can you guys hear me? <laughs> yeah. 
Um, if you click on, does anyone see the participants uh, icon in the bottom? If you click it, something should show up if you have chat open. And then that's how I saw the reactions. Yeah, so we're getting more and more yeses. There you go. Yeah. Now the question is, how to ask a question? Either ask a question or start a chat so I can see when you got an issue. Um, there's a raise hand reaction similar to yes and no. I don't know if here, I just clicked raise hand. I don't know if we can leverage that. Yeah, I see that, yeah. So that's a possibility. Yeah, yeah, and I just, I don't have that option listed um, since I'm the host, so I don't, I don't need to raise my hand, I guess. Okay. Um, so any questions about the next assignment? I have a question, Professor. Yeah, go ahead. Do you, this is Rodney, by the way. Do you intend yeah. on going over any of the accelerometer topics in detail? Um, yes, but not immediately. Okay, that's it. Okay. Yeah, I did. Um, I want to talk about gestures today, but Going over my notes, there's some things I wasn't happy with, and I came across a number of issues that I wasn't able to um, resolve to my satisfaction. So I'm going to try and do that next time. So what I wanted to do today is jump ahead a little bit. Um, so let me now. So everyone now um, see my slide as a screen I'm sharing? Yes. Yeah, okay, good. So that, you know, one of the common things apps do is they need to, you know, talk to a server. Um, and to do this, we need to talk about a few topics one is concurrency because we, you know, the rule is we don't want to do any long running operation on, on the main thread, which means we have to do the background. Um, so we need to talk about concurrency and we also need to talk about HTTP because these days the standard is um, you do you basically do all the communication to your server through HTTP. Now, before we begin, um, Android has evolved over the years. Um, and so there's usually two or three ways of doing almost the same thing. Um, some are newer and some are older. And I want to I want you to be aware of all of them, although I, I won't go into all of them in, in detail. Um, and now that we're Kotlin, Kotlin has some of its own ways of doing things. So particularly when we go through concurrency, um, we will see um, Kotlin has its own thing, all things they can do. And the other thing to note is, again, the goal here is to be able to um, talk to a server in the background and then get the result back. I do something with it on, on the main thread so we can, for example, update the screen. Um, now, AJ, I see you got your hand up. You have a question? 
or is that just remaining from before? We're just testing, uh, Professor. Okay, that's fine. I'm just trying to be alert. Um, and now one of the things is, even though we'll, we'll talk about concurrency for this reason, when we actually start talking about how to do this, um, there's a popular library called Volley created by Google for Android, um, which does the concurrency in the background. Um, but still, I think it's important to understand how we can do concurrency in different ways on Android. Um, if you want to build a game, it's going to become very important to be able to have you know, background threads doing some work to um, keep your game going. With that said, let's get started. So we'll start with looking at concurrency in Android. Um, so, you know, Android is on top of Linux. And so we have all the standard Linux things. Um, and we have to keep separate um, difference between a process and a thread. Um, you know, process is own address space. So you have two different processes. Um, you don't have to worry about one process writing to data where the other process is reading from the same location. Um, but each process, since it's separate, consumes more memory. Um, threads, right, share the same address space, which means it consumes less um, resources, but it also means that um, one thread could be trying to read a piece of data when another thread is trying to write to that data. And so then we get all the standard fun things of making sure that you know, we don't modify data we're currently reading in different threads. So typically, right, Android um, starts with one thread, one process running one thread, and that, well, that's what they say, but I think there's actually a few other threads running in the background. Um, and that thread is the main thread, the UI thread. And all your activity code, right, it runs on the main thread. Right. And we can, right, create more threads to run in the same process or application, and we'll do that in various ways. It is possible to have, to have your application use more than one process, um, but that's pretty rare. So I won't talk about that. And here are the two main rules you have to keep in track of. Um, one is you don't want to block the UI thread. And the reason is all the user interaction is done on, uh, on the UI thread. So anytime they press, you know, tap the screen or shake it, um, anything they do um, is handled on the UI thread. And if your, if your activity or your code is running for a long time on the main thread, then the application becomes um, won't interact until your code is done. Right? This means any code in your activity while it's running, nothing else is happening. The other issue is if we do use a separate thread to do some calculation, that thread should not interact with um, the UI components or widgets that you have on the screen. Um, and this is true for every um, GUI framework I've dealt with. Android's like this, you know, iOS is like this, all the, all the frameworks I've done on the Mac that 
deal with uh, building GUI applications like that. And I'm fairly certain Windows is the same thing because it's no one has really figured out how to get make your user interface to be thread safe. Um, there are a number of different ways in which we can have a thread access um, things in widget one is and we'll see more of this later um, there is a run on UI thread so we can give it a runnable object and then it will run that on the thread um, it's also a view post um, which we can call and give it a runnable and that will be run on the on the UI thread and we call that from the background thread And in Java, you know, this runnable interface is just an interface. It has a run method. Um, so it's not that hard to implement. Um, so in Android, there, there are a number of things we can use. We can create a, a standard Java thread. They recommend you don't do this because, um, unless you really, really need it. Uh, because dealing with threads is complicated to make sure that you handle concurrency correctly. Um, one of the oldest things they gave us was async task. Um, and we'll go through that in detail. Um, and then they later they added the handler with messages and runnables. And with that, they add a looper. Um, and there's also a thing called services, which allow you to run things, basically run an activity in the background. And that activity never has a okay. base part. Yes. Um, and then, like I said, uh, Kotlin has its own the currency issues, right? Um, so in Kotlin, um, they've got coroutines, um, which you can consider as lightweight threads. What Kotlin does is it'll have a thread pool. Um, and then you can, when you create a coroutine, uh, Kotlin will select one of those threads for you. Um, to run your um, coroutine on and if your coroutine blocks it's then taken off that thread and that thread can continue running something else um, and then they got you know fancy things like channels and actors and we'll talk about that um, probably later today uh, so let's start with async task um, The goal here was, look, you know, there's, there's a common things we need to do, right? So we're on the main thread, we want to do some of the background. And so I need to pass information to the background thread to do stuff. Um, and then we may need to get updates so that we can have like a progress bar. So, you know, for example, if we're downloading a file, um, like to show a progress bar, we'll actually um, join we want to know how much of the files already got downloaded. And so our background thread needs to periodically update the main thread, say, well, now we're 20% done, 30% done, et cetera. Um, and then when the background thread is done, we need to be able to pass to the main thread, here's the result, right? We're now done, here's the answer. Um, and so that's a very common situation. An async task was created to do that. So we don't have to physically deal with threads. Right, so basic idea is we're going to create a subclass of async task. And there are a set of methods in async task. Uh, the first one is on pre-execute. Pre 
this is done, that method will be done on the UI thread and it's done first. Um, and then there is do in background. We implement that method like a normal method and it will be run for us in the back in a background thread. So you never have to worry about threads. You just create a do in background method and it's done for you. Um, and then if we want the background thread to send the UI thread an update, um, there are two separate methods involved, publish progress and on progress update. Um, your do and background method can call publish progress, which then triggers on progress update, which is again run automatically for you on the UI thread. Um, and then when you're done, um, on post execute can be called um, and it will be run automatically. Um, on the UI thread after doing background is done. So we, we get the standard case, right? We do something in the UI thread and then we go in a background thread to do some work and we can send updates and we're done. And we have a method which we run automatically on the UI thread. And we don't have to worry about creating threads, scheduling, all that. Um, so, yeah, so you're going to create a, a async task subclass um, and you create it on the UI thread normally as you would do anything um, in an activity and then you can call execute on it and that's it. It'll be done. All the other methods will be done for you automatically. Um, and once a task is done, you cannot call execute on it again. Um, okay. Now, async task is slightly complicated um, because we're dealing with, um, well, the problem is, it's a generic class, but it doesn't know which sort of types you're going to call. So, for example, um, when do and background is, is called for us, right, we need to know, it needs to know which data types are going to be called, but that depends upon what we're doing with async tasks. Um, and so, when you create async, ta async task, has three type parameters. Um, so one is params, and that's the data type that you're going to send to do in background and on send on execute. Um, progress is a data type you're going to send um, to the UI thread in these two methods. And then result is a type of data structure. It could be a float int or you know, array, some more complicated data structure that you're going to um, return and do in background, and it goes on post execute. So far, so good? Yep. So, um, you know, here's sort of an overview. So someplace in my activity, uh, I create a, um, a subclass of async task. I can call execute on it and I pass some data. Um, then pre-execute would be called for us. We don't call it directly. And when it's done, it's going to then call for us do in background. So that's done in a background thread. And then if I want an update, um, I call publish progress 
I pass an information we want to send to the UI thread, and that will automatically call on progress update. All right, and then I can just, if I have a status bar, I can put the status bar using that data. And every time I call publish progress, it's going to call on progress update. Um, and then when my do and background method is done, I return whatever data I want to pass back to the UI thread. And this return value gets passed as an argument on post execute. And then we can do whatever we need to do with that result. Okay, so let's look at an example. Um, yeah, so these are generics. Um, so my example, um, all I'm going to do, oops, yeah, I'm going to go back, go back, 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 um, is that what's going to happen is my background task is just going to display um, a series of words using toast on the main thread. Again, I'm not picking the smallest possible example I can do to illustrate the issue. Um, now, um, when we're dealing with Java on Android, it's, it's common to make async task the inner class makes life a little easier, um, but I decided not to do the inner class in Kotlin. But again, I'm subclassing async task, and now I'm specifying um, three things, you know, three types. First one is the data type that's going to go on, that I'm going to um, pass um, into pre execute. Uh, the second one is what's going to be passed into doing background. And the last one, if you remember, is what's going to pass when, when I'm done and doing background. Um, but in this example, I'm just going to return null. Um, in that case, a return void. Um, and all I'm doing is on the post execute and the pre execute um, is just logging so, so I can see what's going on. Um, and then I forgot. To, yeah, I'm just again logging. I should have used toast. Um, yeah, we'll see that in a minute. Now, so what I do now is, right, I'm creating an array of words and I create my sample task and then I call execute and, oh yeah, always fun when you have to deal with stars and ampersands for pointers. Um, so in Colin, we have to, you know, give it a reference to, the, in this case, the array I'm dealing with. You know, that's my text. Um, you know, that's my code. And that's it. And so what's going to happen when I do this, execute, um, I want to go back, go back, go back. Execute is going to call <clears throat> on pre execute. Um, and then it's going to call my do in background. And again, it gets a little tricky because um, I want to pass an array of words. Um, and so But I told it I was going to pass in string. And so we have to say oh, it was far arg. And what that will do then is it, it creates words as a collection. Um, and so then I'm 
cycling through the words with a, with a for loop. Any questions so far? I'll take that as a no. Um, so now I want to talk about um, I want to jump through Kotlin, um, coroutines, um, if any of you have dealt with threads in the past in Java or in other environments, um, you'll probably appreciate this more than other people. Um, so there is a want function in, in Kotlin, which will run a coroutine um, in the background thread. So what I do is I've created two functions, the normal functions, um, and I'm using the sleep function to si simulate um, that the function is doing something that takes time. Um, and then I just again log it result to see the output. Um, and so then here's my program. You know, first I, I write a log statement, um, which gives me my start, right? Um, and then I call global scope launch and I pass it this function. And it's going to start that function on a separate thread um, for us. But notice that then my output, I get second because it doesn't wait for the foo function to start up on the separate thread. It just starts that process off for us. Um, and then I launch another function, which just writes the log immediately. And in this run, that's the one that came next. And then I log um, third, right? And then I launch another function in the background on a separate thread, the bar with a message. And then I say, I'm done. And so then I get uh, the end function and then finally, um, in foo and in bar appear. Each time you run this, it might be slightly different. All right, so I ran this a second time. Um, and yeah, the output is slightly different. Giving us some confidence that we're actually um, using threads. Okay, now, there are times when we want to, when we run a bunch of stuff and then wait until the, all that stuff is on the background is done and then continue doing something. Um, so for that, we've got run blocking. And what's gonna happen is run blocking is going to run all this, and when all the, the coroutines are done, then we'll execute that statement. And so again, I've got my function foo, function bar, right? Same as before. And again, I'm basically doing the same thing. And since I'm in the run blocking, I can just say launch. And again, the output up to here is going to vary each time we run it, but this will always come after all the coroutines are done. Okay. Um, so if you want to run coroutines, you have to add them to your build gradle module parts. 
Um, the current version is 1.3.0. Um, and the examples I've run so far, I needed import launch and import run blocking. So I keep thing to keep in mind is coworkings are not threads, right? They're lightweight. They are run on threads, and when a coworking gets blocked, and you know, say you want a coworking to read from the network or read from the file, um, and it gets blocked waiting for the network access. The thread is on, it's not blocked. If your coworking is suspended, um, and that affects when you're doing work. Um, there are various ways we can we things can be suspended. Um, if a function can be suspended, we need to specify it. And we have an example of that coming up. Um, so it's the same example, but it's more proper because now I'm saying this function can be suspended. And now I'm calling delay because that will suspend the function, All right? And the key point here is delay will notify the system that this function is suspended and then it will take it off the thread so the thread can continue running. The previous example is calling system clock delay. Um, let's see, where was it? Let's go back there. Um, Right, so I'm calling system clock sleep. Um, and so what's happening here is this function, right, basically blocks um, whatever thread's being run on until the sleep is done. So we haven't notified the system that this thread is suspended. Uh, but here, right, delay tells the system. Um, this function is now function is, should be suspended. I'll take it off the thread and reschedule it into the thread if need be later. So it's very common to make all the functions suspended. Um, then we know we're going to use as coroutines. Now, um, Big deal here is um, basically Android has dispatchers that run coroutines, um, and there's three different types main, IO, and default. Um, and they're designed to do different things. Um, so, main runs all the coroutines on the main thread, which means those. Coroutines can interact with the UI elements directly and um, they can update live data. Um, Dispatchers.io runs them off the main thread um, and it's optimized for disk IO and network IO and file IO, right? Um, so it's often you use it for file IO, database access, and network access. Um, so we'll see later, both these two are handled for us. So we use room and volley, so we don't need to worry about it. Um, and then this factor's default is run off the main thread and it's used for CPU intensive work. So I wanna look at Sort of fake examples illustrate um, how we can use coroutines to um, replace async tasks or parts of async tasks. So I've got two functions. Um, one is fetch docs, and what it's going to do is it's going to call my other function get which is actually going to go on the network and grab some data and 
since it's a fake example, I actually don't include how to do that. Um, now, when we run this fetch docs, um, it's going to automatically run on the main. This is slightly confusing to me at first because um, there's a there's a dispatcher called default, which is not actually the default. It's main is a default. You cannot specify where we want it run. Um, So when we run this, when we call this function um, with a launch or in a run block, um, this function is going to be run on dispatcher's main, which means it's being run on the main thread, which means once I get the result back, I can now take that result and interact with GUI elements directly. Um, Now, when I call get, it's going to be run on the dispatcher's main too, but inside, I can use this with context and specify which dispatcher I want to use. And I want to use dispatchers.io, which means right, whatever code I put in here will be run uh, not on the main thread, but on a background thread. And when I return the result, again, it's returned up here, and all of a sudden I go back to the main thread. So I've accomplished several things. Um, I can start a function to do some things I want in the main thread, call another function or coroutine that does all its work on the background thread and returns the result, and now I can actually work um, do work right on the um, the UI thread right which is exactly what one of the main things async task does is right we start on do pre-execute on the UI thread do in background right execute in the background thread and then what I return from doing background is then sent to the UI thread. Um, and that's exactly what I've done here, and I don't have to worry about writing subclasses and worrying about generics and what type of tasks. Any questions? Okay, um, at least I haven't put everyone to sleep yet. Good sign. You know, I just turn off the main thread. And there's a lot more we can talk about. Um, and here's a, a link to um, more documentation about um, coroutines. You know, if you're going to do a complicated application using Colin and needs a lot of background threads, you should really look into um, understanding coroutines as opposed to trying to do an AC task or some of the other solutions that we get. Um, I want to briefly talk about some of the other things that we can do. Standard Android. Um, so there's a handler which allows us to send messages from one thread to another. Um, and it gets slightly complicated because it only goes in one direction. So we need a handler going from the first thread to the second thread. And then we need a handler going from the right um, second thread back to the first thread and the passing between threads um, gets slightly complicated threads are, are not the same thing as functions 
And so we have to create this message object to actually um, pass between the two threads using the handler. Um, and again, since message is generic, um, you know, to create a message that has public fields for arg1, arg2, object, and what. Um, and the, the, these fields mean whatever you want them to mean. Um, and so the basic operation is I got two threads, you know, say A is the main thread and B is a thread working in the background. Um, when I, first I create a handler and then, then when I create the thread, I pass that handler to the thread in its constructor. Um, and then, um, you know, on the, the thread, I want to send them back first. I have to get a message. I can then, when I create the message, I can pay, I, I can set the various fields, and then I call send message on it right in my handler, and then that handler has a handle message which we implement, which then reads the data from that message and works on the um, first thread. And to create messages, right, there are a bunch of methods depending on which arguments you want to specify, you know, the what, the object, you know, the what, the two integer objects are all of them. And we have to create a handler subclass and have to implement this method, handle message, um, right, so again, we're, we're creating subclasses, um, creating messages. And I think once you get over the shock of using coroutines, you would find it easier to deal with than using handlers and messages. And then, of course, we can send a message. We can do it immediately, or we can post it um, in the future. We also create a thing called Looper. Um, and the difference here is um, that basically Looper waits in the background for a message. It processes it and writes another message, whereas typically um, when you use handles and threads, you handle a request once and you move on. So we get this loop, handle message, get a message, do something, pass it back, right? Um, and then we need, we have to create messages sent back and forth. We need handlers. We need a separate handler thread. Um, so it gets more involved. So again, I think coroutine should be much easier to deal with. Um, and your handler thread has a start and a loop of repair and methods to actually end the threads. Colin has something similar um, called channels. Um, and basically what it allows you to do is have separate, you know, I've got one function, my foo function um, is going to send a bunch of messages out. Um, and then 
My other function in bar is going to read those messages. Um, it's like a loop where you, we can have a loop where it reads a message, just something, return it. Um, if you've taken an operating system, a common example you use is consumer and producer, where a producer process produces a bunch of stuff, whatever that happens to be, um, and the consumer will read it. Um, just the, the same thing, and we connect them to the channel. Um, so I create a channel, and we have to tell the channel what sort of data we're going to pass and how big a buffer we want. In this case, the buffer is going to be three, so it can hold three things before it blocks. Um, and then I can call launch foo, and that's going to send this, start this function running on a thread. And it's going to, again, you know, the delay is going to wait, and it's also going to tell I will tell the Kotlin system that, oh, you, this, you can suspend this function and run something else. Um, and then it's going to, right, basically go through one through five and then square it and send that out into the channel. Um, and then, you know, my, my bar function gets the other end of the channel and it will read from it one at a time with my for loop. Um, again, I just print it out. So again, I think um, once you get over the shock of coroutines and channels, um, it tends to be a simpler solution than what you get in Java or what Kotlin built on top of Java. Okay, that's all I want to talk about the currency. Um, again, I'm going to point out that the main reason we want concurrency in the short term is when we build an application to talk to the network, um, getting data off the network is a very slow process in comparison to the processor speed. So we don't want to do it on the main UI thread. Um, and as I said at the beginning of class, um, there's a common library that most people use to do um, network action called volley and volley will handle it for us um, so some of the concurrency is a little bit too um, complicated for you don't worry because our main use case will be handled for us um, now there's a lot of ways in which we can transport data on network um, the most efficient is to open a socket and send data back and forth. Um, I used to teach a class called 580, where that's what we did. Um, it's far more efficient than using HTTP. Um, it's also far more complicated, and the networks are fast enough now that people don't worry about the overhead created by using HTTP. Now, I want to point out one thing. Um, HTTP was not designed to, to send data. It was designed to send web pages. And so some of you might be um, have experience building web pages and scraping. Well, once we send a web page back and forth. Um, it then becomes possible to write a program which will look at the HTML you sent back and extract data from it. Um, I don't know if anyone has done this in the past, but um, you want to avoid doing that at all possible. 
And when you build an application that talks network, you don't want to do web scraping. It's very fragile. Um, I do this um, for various reasons on um, different applications I use. And as soon as they change something on the web page, your code that scrapes the data can break. Um, but, so we're not talking about going out and scraping data from the web page. What we're, we're talking about, right, we're going to send data back in that you request, and then we can look at that data. Um, so HTTP, um, now basically, the way HTTP, a client, most of the time is a web browser, but we will be using Android application to act as a client. Um, so the client opens a socket to the server, um, it then sends a request to the server, give me this page, or give me this data. The server then um, fetches the page that you so the client asks for the data and sends it back, and then the socket is closed. This is the basic operation. Um, now it turns out that opening and closing a socket every time you want to make a request is rather inefficient given the way that the online network works. And so HTTP has been modified a bit to allow that socket to remain open and send multiple requests. Um, but we don't need to talk about worry about that. Um, now when we um, send data well, when we send the client sends a request, um, that request has a bunch of headers um, and potentially a, bo a body with text with data in it. And the responses have headers and there's a body. So when you're on a web browser, um, the browser hides these headers from you um, and just shows you the text. Usually the body contains a web page in terms of HTML, and it then renders that web page and shows you that. Um, but it's important to know that those headers exist because that gives you, that is overhead. Um, so there's um, various ways you can look at what's going on behind the scenes. If you've got the Chrome web browser, there's a Chrome extension which allows you to look at the headers. Um, I think now that if you turn on developer mode in Chrome, it'll show, show you the headers. Um, also, um, Postman you know, um, there's actually an application now with Postman that you can download, which will show you all the headers. Um, Here's an example of using post, the old version of Postman, looking at, you know, just a CS um, website, and it shows you all the various headers that um, were attached to that particular request. Um, and then if we look at the body, right, there is, it's all HTML. Um, Well, uh, you can actually, it's getting harder and harder to do this. It used to be you could just do it by hand. Um, but various features have made it impossible. So this is a very old version. Um, Telnet typically doesn't work anymore. Um, because people are shutting it down. But here I'm requesting, um, you know, the Google page and the port number the server works on. Um, and then I have to type in, I typed in this get, and then here's all the headers I get back, right?
there are two types, a bunch of types of requests. Um, the most common you're going to use are get and post. Um, now, typically, when you're in a web browser, get is used to fetch web pages. In our usage, we're going to use get to get data from the server. Um, and then post will we'll use post to send data to the server. All right again, um, request contains the URL of the page or data we want, headers, and then any extra information we need. Um, and then response will have headers, and the body will contain the actual um, response. Again, if you're in a web browser, it's usually going to be HTML, but in our case, it's going to be data um, sent to the server. Like I said, using HTTP for data, it's just e it's a lot easier than dealing with network programming. Um, some other advantages, it means you can use a web server with the back end. So if people know PHP, you can actually set up a, a server to serve data. Um, and it makes it easy for the clients to make requests. And Another big one is a lot of places have firewalls. So for example, San Diego State um, has a firewall, um, but a common exception in the firewall is port 80 for web server to deal with um, web pages. Um, so it make, helps avoid firewall issues with your server. Um, HTML is a terrible, terrible way of passing data. So I mean, just never don't use HTML for data, right? Just never, 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 never. Um, two common formats are either XML or JSON. Um, if you've got a choice between XML and JSON, always choose JSON. Um, JSON is much easier to deal with. Um, it's less verbose, it takes less resources. Um, XML, right, it's, it looks like HTML, but it's more generic. So here's an example. Um, and you can see I'm describing CDs and so, um, Again, there's always a start tag and an end tag, and then there's a start tag for CD, another end tag. Um, and then for each piece of data we've got, we have another, we've got start tags and end tags. Um, so per item of data we have, there are a lot of, there's a lot of hard in terms of these tags. Um, And Android comes with, you know, several different parsers that we can use. Um, again, if you can avoid XML, you should, um, because XML is more verbose, the parsing is slower and takes more resources. Um, and there we go, right? They're both slower and more resources. Um, let's see. We've got five more minutes here. I'll start this for a little bit and we'll back up next time and start open here. Um, JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. You know, basically, many years ago, some programmer who was building web pages get tired of using XML and so they created this JSON format to try and send JavaScript like objects back and forth and it caught on big time. Um, so almost every language you can think of 
as um, a library to do with JSON um, converting from their native format to JSON back and forth. Um, and so, um, you know, basically we, we take JSON objects and put them strings um, and JSON deals with these data types. Um, right, any sort of number, that's easy, so string, arrays of numbers, strings, true, false, null, all the things. By objects, they mean just a map, key value pairs. And so, you know, I say Java, but that in almost any language, you can convert to JSON, and then we can save in a file, we can send it to server back again, um, and then convert it into a native data format. So all of these are numbers, legal numbers in JSON. Um, these are all strings, and then there's no true and false. And here is right just basically, you know, JSON arrays, right? It's an array of one, two, three, array can handle any data type. Um, and so here the bottom one I have the middle element is another array. And finally we'll stop here. Uh, an object is basically a dictionary, it's a key value pairs. Keys are always strings. The value can be any legal JSON data type. All right, so here's a very simple example. Key, uh, the value is a string. Another key, age, and the value is an integer. And a slightly more complicated example. Um, you know, we're looking at office hours, so some ID number, which office, or phone number, email address. Um, and then we have another object, right? So next time we'll look at how to deal with um, JSON and code. Any questions or issues before we end for the day? I'm good from my side. Okay, good. No questions. Well, Professor, I have one question. Okay. Uh, on core routine, uh, like every time it launches, uh, whenever we say launch, are we creating one thread or how it will be? What happens in the background when we say launch? Okay, so the question is about um, when we call launching a call thread, are we creating a new thread? No. Um, depending upon how we how we launch it, it's, it will run on an existing thread. Um, your call routine will keep a pool of threads available for us. Okay, so okay, so whenever we say launch, it just like I mean. Uh, kind of like we are raising an event to perform something. Right, and we are then scheduling it on an existing thread. Okay, gotcha. Launching that, is pretty fast. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Uh, I have one. Okay. Um, I was hoping you can grade my assignment one. Yes, I will work on that. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I'll take that as a no and we can adjourn for the day. And I hope that you know, having to do everything remotely isn't too hard on people. But eventually things will get back to normal. And I'll see everyone or some of you on Thursday.
Okay, see you then. Yeah. yeah. See you, Professor. Mm -hmm.